If you won't know until November is the earliest, if the vaccine works, when do you think we can reach herd immunity? So that's a great question. Uh, good morning or, or good afternoon. And thank you for having us. If you think about the timelines, you know, we started this morning dosing the first participant in the phase three. Uh, we have, you know, almost 90 sites in the U.S. Uh, we have spent a lot of time to map out the sites where there is a lot of infection because this is a phase three for efficacy. You know, we have 15,000 people that will receive a vaccine, 15,000 that will receive placebo. And we'll determine with the FDA the efficacy of a vaccine based on the attack rate, the infection rate. And so what we uh, anticipate is you could have data, you know, in the November time frame. It is possible that we could have data in October. That is not the base plan. That is the best plan. Uh, and then when this happens, I think uh, based on the data, the FDA could decide to give us emergency approval. Uh, and that will make the vaccine available in the U.S. for uh, people at our highest risk, the elderly, maybe healthcare workers, while the FDA reviews the file for approval for the general population. And so what we have been doing at Moderna, you know, we raised $1.3 billion of capital in May to invest in raw materials, in equipment, hiring new team members and training them. And as we speak, we are making as many vaccines as we can with the goal of making uh, 500 million doses, maybe up to a billion doses in 2021. We just talk about how easy it's going to be to attract the, the necessary um, sort of demographics within the, within the test. Um, how easy is it going to be to attract those key demographics, the most vulnerable demographics, particularly seniors, are you struggling in that area? Uh, are people coming forward and wanting to take part in the test? So it's a bit too early to know about the phase three, given we just started this morning. But what I can tell you is over the last weeks, we've had you know, thousands and thousands of people across the U.S. Uh, asking us to um, come uh, into the study. We've had people into uh, the diverse groups, both elderly, African-American, Latinos and so on, which is very important for us. We want to make sure that the study has the right representation from the core demographics in the U.S. that are the highest risk. Uh, th this might be a, a silly question, but bear with me here. Um, is your vaccine an antibody vaccine? Is it a T cell? Like, how is it going to work as compared with no, some of the other the vaccines vaccine out there? Is a vaccine that is able uh, to. Uh, activate both B cell and T cell. So it's a bit complicated. The B cells provide, if you want, antibody, neutralizing antibody. And uh, the T cells are used uh, for memory. And what we've shown in the human study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine two weeks ago is that we had a very high titer of neutralizing antibody, around four times more than people that are with covalescent sera, people that have been naturally infected. And we've also shown some CD4 T cells, which is a very good sign for the future efficacy of a vaccine. But at the end of the day, like everybody else, every other company, we have to run the phase three to really know the full efficacy of a vaccine. We are, though, seeing other vaccines uh, producing a T cell response. Is this going to be one of the key differentiators, you think, uh, as to whether or not we get an a antibody and a cellular response? Is that going to be one of the kind of areas that we are going to, as, as people that are going to receive it, need to differentiate? Yeah, I think people are very uh, actively looking into those differentiation now because we don't have any more data. So everybody is trying, from industry, the scientific community, the regulators, to try to map out what do we know today from the phase one study for those that have run a phase one and published the data, and there are only a few companies, through the preclinical animal work, just to try to guess. But the real test that everybody is going to have to go through is to run for the U.S. a 30,000 participant phase three study, 50% placebo control, you know, every other person getting the vaccine, every other person getting the placebo, and measuring the number of events and to really know like this, the true efficacy of a vaccine. People are trying to guess now, but the phase three is going to be the real test for everybody. How do you price the vaccines? 
So we have not communicated yet the price of a vaccine. We have communicated that we intend to make a profit from the vaccine. You know, our investors have invested over the years $2 billion to get the technology to this point. In May, we raised an additional $1.3 billion of our shareholder capital to make at risk as much vaccine as we can before the launch. So it's a very risky endeavor. Uh, and so we need to get a return to those investors. At the same time, we know it's a pandemic uh, and we want to be very responsible for pricing. We, we plan to underprice this vaccine for its value, especially in the pandemic phase. So we, we believe that we might end up having two prices over time, a very low price during the pandemic, uh, that is, of course, as you know, declared by the WHO, and then potentially a higher price during the endemic phase. But in all cases, even the endemic price that could be higher will be set up within the range of existing vaccines. At Moderna, we have a very broad platform, more than 20 programs in development. We have said all along, we do not intend to maximize profit on this vaccine. It will not be the right thing to do from an ethical standpoint. Uh, and we, we want to make sure that the vaccine is available to everybody who is looking for vaccination. Do you think it's going to be priced below $19.5? Because that's the price implied by the deal that Pfizer has done with the U.S. government. Now, Pfizer's taken no U.S. money. You have. Are you going to have to come in under that price? So, again, we have not disclosed price. Uh, we will make sure that there is a lot of value for the healthcare system. And, of course, as you say, the U.S. government has helped us. And so uh, we will, of course, reflect those grants in the final pricing. Now, part of what you price it at, and then even if you intend to make a profit, then has to be sort of equipment. And I just wonder kind of where are the supply chain issues that you're noticing as you are moving forward with this? Like, where are you having to pay more for stuff? We talk a lot about the glass vials, et cetera. Can you give us some insight into that? Sure. So for manufacturing, we have both our own plant in Massachusetts in the U.S. We've also partnered with Lonza from Switzerland where they are already making at their New Hampshire site in the U.S. product for commercial use, and they are getting ready in Switzerland in the VISP uh, site to be able to make product for outside the U.S. We've also partnered with Catalan in the U.S. for filling the vials, and with Rovi in Spain for filling the vials for outside the U.S. supply chain. As you say, there has been a, a few pinch points, including access to vials. You know, nobody was planning in their... 2020 budget and manufacturing plans for a global pandemic. Uh, but everybody is working uh, as hard as we can to increase manufacturing capacity. In the US, for example, the government is really coordinating supply because you might have companies today that are buying a lot of vials. They will use them if your vaccine makes it, but if your vaccine do not get approval, they will have no use for the vials. And so this is where the government can be helpful to make sure that we work across the board in a coordinated way so that we ensure as many vaccines as we can for the consumer around the world. There's already concern that some people aren't going to want to take the virus. How many people as, uh, aren't going to want to take the vaccine for the virus, should I say, Stefan? Um, how many people are going to be taking a two-dose regime? How many people are going to be taking a one-dose regime? And kind of how big a, a demographic are going to be in the, in the latter category? Because if you've got to take two, it's just going to be more problematic to get people to sign up. Yes and no. I mean, if you, if you think about it, this is such an incredible disruption to our lives. Uh, you know, we have never seen a pandemic like this on a global basis like we have now. You know, in, in 100 years, none of us have seen that in our lifetime. Uh, all our life has been disrupted from a health standpoint. You know, we personally have, have had friends who lost loved ones uh, already in the last six months. You know, our lives have been impacted. You know, the kids are not in school anymore. Uh, we have to wear face masks as we go into stores. Uh, I think the motivation of people is going to be much higher for other situations. If you look at you know, things like flu, you know, depending on the years and depending on the countries, you have, you know, 50, 60, sometimes 70 percent of people using the vaccine. It is very hard at this stage to estimate how many people are going to be using this vaccine. But I think the disruption is so profound 
that will anticipate a lot of people, especially people at risk. We know that the elderly uh, are at very high risk, people with comorbidity. And so I will not be surprised that in 2021, actually, a lot of people around the world will be willing to take the vaccine to go back to a normal life.